This episode of Fermented Adventure the Podcast features Mika Lipianen of Kiro Distillery Company. We had a fascinating conversation learning about Finland's first rye distillery, their whiskey, and how they got started. Be sure to reach out to Mika and Kiro Distillery and let them know what you thought about the podcast. Cheers! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Sheen, and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, FA Nation, let's meet our guest. He's Mika Lipianen. I'm Rich Shane. This is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Mika, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Fantastic to be here. Well, I'm fantastically glad you're here because we're going to talk Cairo Distillery Company. We're going to talk Finland's Cairo Distillery Company. And what I'd like to introduce and share with my listeners first is how did Cairo Distillery Company get started? So we were five friends in a sauna passing around a perfectly respectable bottle of uh, U.S. rye whiskey. And, uh, you know, it's sauna temperature, so so the whiskey was getting a bit hot, but so was our thinking around the fact that we Finns, we love rye, we grow up on rye porridge, rye bread, rye everything. Why isn't anybody making whiskey out of rye in Finland? And so we, we thought that we could create something new around the whole culture of whiskey, new area, and uh, go out there, do our own style. And that's where we begin. You know, you talk about rye and growing up on that grain in Finland. Yeah. Certainly as being here in the States, you know, we have our perspective of Pennsylvania rye, Maryland rye, um, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, all those areas, New York with their terroir and provenance. Talk about Finland rye. Talk about, you know, really, you know, what makes that special for that, that rye you're producing today? Uh, it's a good question. First of all, when we were sampling some rye whiskeys with people who we think might be interested or at least give us an honest teardown on whether the idea was good or not, when we tasted some U.S. rye whiskeys, for a Finn, they don't really taste like we understand the taste of rye to be. And this is this is not to, to put anybody down, but it's just a different way of, of first of all, how the grain grows. And then how you handle the grain in the process in order to maximize the actual taste of rye. And I, I'd say in the process of, of growing our crops, there's two big differences. So our growing seasons are very short. So we are so far up north. We, we have a growing season between 12 and 14 weeks. But what we do get is intense sunlight. So you get 22 hours of sunlight where our distillery is per day for your grain, which makes small grains because it's a short growing season but so so packed with flavor and with rye it's all on the outer surface so there's no husk per se like you have in barley or corn but in the rye all the taste is in there on the outer surface and that's why we push it all the way through the process and just take the essence of rye with us is this something because for me it's an introduction to the mindset of being from finland Mm -hmm. Is this something that the consumer grows up more with this style of rye? Because you said you're the first rye distillery in Finland. So I would imagine most of what you're getting is from the States at this point or other European areas, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we didn't really have a culture of rye whiskey at all, per se. We just have it as a human consumption crop. So 
it's mostly bread, uh, some porridge and, and other foodstuffs. But <clears throat> Finland has been, to be honest, historically uh, meat, potatoes and vodka country. So very, very simple distilling culture. And in Finland, for one reason or another, barley has ended up being the, the grain where we distill vodka from. But rye has always been our edible great grain. So it's not like a horse feed or a rotation crop. Um, it, it's something we eat uh, as food. So, so therefore, getting the taste out there through the whiskey, we like to see ourselves as pioneers in that. I asked that question because in my head, I'm thinking if, if I like my coffee with a lot of sugar mm. or if I like more sweeter things, then my palate's conditioned in a certain way. So you yeah. talk about, well, you're eating breads, you're eating porridge, your palate's conditioned to rye. And I wonder how that stands out specifically to the, you know, to the Finnish, um, you know, consumer, you know, yeah. what they're, you know, drinking and how their palate's already acclimated to that rye and, you know, how that works within their flavor profile. Because if you're talking about, hey, you're in a sauna, you're mm -hmm. drinking American rice. You yeah. may have already the ability to pick these flavor components out, or you may be more sensitive or more susceptible to different flavor profiles. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I mean, for for me personally, taste has always been taste is culture and taste is community. So we as humans, we're not that good in actually like physically tasting things apart from the the five, six, seven, how do you want to classify them, the main elements. But the associative brain that we have that connects tastes with other memories and other senses uh, produce fantastic nuanced tastes that, that are very personal to you. And the culture you grow up in and with really dictates what you're familiar with. And, and you know, for me, this tastes like rye. For you, it might, might taste like a bit like earthy cinnamon, uh, but you don't have a name for it. And but I I do, and and uh, you're right that we we are trying to bring a whole new taste culture into the world of rye. And we know it's kind of like a long slog. If, if we try to just copy what the guys do in Speyside in Scotland or what you do in in um, let's say Philadelphia style rye in the U.S., we might have an easier way. In one sense. But would we be as uh, we wouldn't be as worth remembering as a brand and as a product if we did that? And we just have to do our own thing. You talked about how this got started in a sauna, drinking rye. Mm -hmm. So how does it go from saying I think we can make this product and make it delicious to opening up a distillery? Because <laughs> wow. I've had those <laughs> moments, Mika, that you know. I'd like to make this, but um, they they normally just get end up, you know, they end up by finishing a bottle and then I move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I exactly know what you mean. So like in, in Finland, sauna is such a such a commonplace thing for us. So every week, every weekend we'd go alone, we go with friends, we go like for us, sauna is kind of like our pub. Uh, so we, we go there and, and enjoy uh, our friends company and, and connecting with them. And what ends up happening is that you have these like all sorts of business ideas, you know, this, you know, extendable dog gate or what, whatever. Yeah, it seems like a fantastic thing. But next morning, uh, they usually don't go anywhere. But right now, like with this idea, we were so enthused by it that we ran out of the sauna and started emailing people we knew that might know a bit more about the industry. So, so none of us were industry veterans by any any means. Uh, so I was in pharmaceuticals and Kalle grew algae for Helsinki University and whatever. But we we started emailing people right off the bat. So like, what it's was it what is it like to make whiskey, store it, mature it, sell it, market it, and um, that started us up on a process which then two and a half years later saw us opening up the distillery. Now talk about the process. Who came up with formulation? Who came up with acquiring all your materials and your equipment? And look, it's rye from Finland. 
how did you start conversations with the local farmers and say, hmm. I know we're growing barley for vodka, or this is the tradition of what comes out of Finland, but guess what? We want to grow rye and distill it. Share the process of just, you know, that becoming, you know, doing some research to actually two, two some years later, opening up the mm. distillery. Yeah, but for me, when I look back at that time, I almost have like the training montage song from Rocky movies playing in my head where we just, we'd read books, we'd, we'd phone up people, we'd phone up distillers asking whether we can come and work for the free for the weekend or, or during our summer holidays. Um, we went to talk to potential um, suppliers like farmers and, and uh, steel suppliers. So our first deals ended up being from Germany. Um, we went to talk to investors. Uh, and at that time, Finland was coming off of the tragedy that was Nokia's rise and fall in mobile phones, which then turned into a big mobile gaming boom in Finland. And all the investors wanted wanted to know was like, so how are you going to you know, gamify this thing? And no, 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 we, we need to actually, we need to build some walls and we need to buy the steels and we need to build up the stock and then we need to wait for a while. And it wasn't a very, um, very interesting proposition at that time for most Finnish investors. So we, we ended up getting a lot of the knowledge. We ended up getting a great network of uh, mentors, advisors, people who we could call and talk to. And we ended up bootstrapping the, uh, the whole operation up by ourselves and, and some bank loan behind it. But it was a hard slog for two years since most of us, well, all of us were still working our day jobs and our head distiller, Kalle, one of us five founders, he was the guy who was growing algae uh, in the university. So he, he was really good with biological processes and had a background in, in let's say, a bit of licensed beer brewing. Uh, so he ended up formulating the, um, the recipes, choosing the yeast, deciding on a long fermentation time, and then gradually we just built up the network in order to get a company going on the back of it. And uh, we were out there singing the praises of, you know, what's to come and, and this fantastic idea of bringing Finnish rye into spirits. And uh, yeah, people really seem to connect with it. So we got an audience early on. I, I love just the story here. First of all, taking it for five guys into a sauna, and then you're mm. talking about your bringing people together with the knowledge and experience, not necessarily in the distillery industry, the distilling industry, but you've got the, the chemical background and you've, you've got this passion. And that, that's really what comes out most for me is, is your passion to make this happen. And to hear that, look, we didn't know really what we were doing. We learned yep. along the way. People didn't want to invest. We'll, we'll invest. It's our dream. We'll make it happen. How did you come up with the name Cairo Distillery Company. Where did, what's the origin of that? So I would say, and, and I'm uh, I'm not trying to sort of like just reduce us into like a phenomenon of of the time, but I would say like around that time, past the financial crash in in 08, I, I think there were a lot of people who who were kind of disillusioned by uh, corporate jobs and the corporate world in in general, and and wanted to do something that that's a bit more humble, has um, has some sort of a following through a passion rather than just necessity. So you had crafting this, crafting that starting up. So anything, coffee, cookies, chocolate, um, whiskeys. And I, I think we were we were kind of in that wave. But but for us, th the key thing there was that we we really get passionate about Kind of deep, maybe different things, but all around this project. So for me, whiskey was the thing. I was the sort of the OG whiskey nerd of our our crew, and for Kalle, it was turning sugars into starches with yeast into something beautiful that tastes fantastic. So he was doing weird and funky things with his beer, and and he went on to continue that uh, to the power of ten with our whiskeys. And then we had Miko, who was passionate about brands. Uh, Miko, who was passionate about developing the local community around our distillery, and Yoni, who's just like the quintessential sales guy. 
we things are quite normally you, you know just like humble stay at home kind of types he he went on to found a logistics business in in uh south korea and hong kong without you know any connections to those cultures so we just came from very different backgrounds but we had very com- complementary skills in a nice way and we got them all together for this great common project cairo talk about the name yes uh kura distillery company oh. so kura is just a place name so it's it's the name of the village where we are from and uh, well the actual name is isokura which just means big kura it's you know where we 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 are imaginative on other things um but it's a fantastic place for us to go to since one of us five founders he's um, he's really got deep roots there he lives next to the distillery and he summoned the rest of us who were living in in the southern regions of finland uh, in the capital city so he he said like let's go and look at a couple of spots where to start this common endeavor and there was this fantastic old stone built dairy next to where he lives which was emptied of all dairy operations back in 2008 and it was just storage space so we went in there and saw like okay for a distillery if we want to do it like our style a finnish style where we don't invent stories about people and their histories and you know we had these legendary characters who were drinking rye whiskey back in the 1700s we had none of that but it has a lot of history that we could respectfully borrow and work ourselves into without imagining or or making up stories and that's kind of been our way from the start throw the doors wide open show everybody what we're doing why we're doing it no bullshit in marketing it, we just tell our story how we how we do things with what philosophy who does it and please come and be a part of the family well you mentioned you know that rocky theme music playing in your head and we are just outside of philadelphia so yeah. one of the things i just appreciated learning that more in detail about your story is that uh, you you took my philadelphia accent and uh, you helped correct me to make sure i'm pronouncing it as cura so <laughs> right yeah. um cura so you know hey look i'm from philly man it's it's cairo right but uh yeah. cura and uh you know so we pronounce it as it's as it's written and yeah. uh, now i've learned some some great uh an appreciation for the history and how you went to uh to to choose that location and, and all of that Look, if anybody, you know, take a second, um, put the podcast on pause and go look up your website. It's very captivating right from the beginning. And I'm not going to let people know about what I saw, but uh, I'll tell you what, it's one of the most fun websites I've seen in a long time. And I, I think that goes to talk about the personality of you five gentlemen and your spirit. And we talked off, you know, before we started the podcast, you know, you mentioned the word honest hedonism. What is yeah. honest hedonism? Talk about that. So for us, honest hedonism, which is one of the founding principles of Kura Distillery Company, is about enjoying great things in life, hopefully also in great company, but being honest about like, do you like this or not? Or am I trying to signal something with it? Or do I actually find a personal connection that really makes me enjoy the whiskey the box it comes or the packaging it comes in the culture behind it is there that sense of hedonism that that is driven from within me rather than i'm meeting up with somebody else's expectations or or trying trying to impress somebody so for us that honest hedonism was kind of a counter to what we could see still in the remnants of let's say the nightclub world with the gold flaky vodkas and all of that but also a counter to the modern uh, version of that which is you know i always have to be the person in the know i i my whole uh, life is built around the social capital i have and and the new opening of this and that i i know where to go to and take my friends no honest hedonism is just like sitting down hopefully in good company having a great drink that you know that i'm i'm actually drinking for myself and to enjoy you talk about you know you're vulnerable you're passionate you're also yes. competitive i love that D- does that describe you know if i met you and i said wow 
this is what, you know, a Finn must be like. Do you think that that's culturally what would describe the nature? I mean, sometimes that goes region to region, mm. but do you think that that describes it and the personality and the, you know, the, the presentation of, of who you are? Ooh, what is an average Finn and how do I compare it? It's a difficult question. I mean, generally, we Finns are, are seen as a bit drawn in, quite shy, hard to hard to chip in the sort of the outer layer of, of who we are. But when you get in this, there's this like really deep sense of community and hospitality and, and uh, sticking to itness. Uh, so, so like we are really like loyal, faithful and all of that. So I, I would say I, I, I at least aspire to embody some of these, these qualities, but at the same time, it's, we're still, yeah, we're still too shy to really get out there. So you, like if you look at the Nordics, you see a lot of Swedes, a lot of Danes. They're they're out there. They're doing their thing. They're founding businesses elsewhere. We Finns, we stay at home a bit too much, I would say. So I, it's something we're trying to change in in the hospitality scene back in Finland too. What has the feedback been? What's how has this been received? You're the first rye whiskey distillery in Finland. You're changing palates in a way, as you talk about, you're bringing people out by bringing to the market something that they've never had or may not have had in a long time in yeah. Finland. What's that been received like? What, what's the reception been for you? It's It's been great. I mean, we when we say we, we distill spirits out of rye, so we do multiple categories, right? We do gin, we do whiskey, uh, we even have a creamy cure out of our, our rye whiskey and local um, local cream. So so the people who drink these traditionally uh, might be very, look very different than than the general Kura audience who we go after or who, who naturally gravitates to us. But I would say by and, by and large, like the, the majority of the feedback back we get, whether it's the quality of the liquid or, or or our brand is and has been excellent. I mean, we're a small market, right? So we our landmass is the size of Germany, but we are only 5.5 million people. So it's like there's just nobody home. But we've been really taken into the homes of, of people in, in Finland, whether it's with the gin or, or the whiskey or the cream liqueur, and people are loving it. And when we now brought it out to our major export markets, our Germany and, and the UK, and the feedback here as well is has been frankly phenomenal. We just haven't had any enough whiskey to sell, and uh, we are, you know, we're in the US with a small presence now, hoping to make it bigger next year. But uh, the feedback there too, uh, well, you you tell me, but um, what we've been getting has been really good. Well, this is a great segue. We have three bottles that you were graciously uh, you, you were gracious to share. We have your gin, of course. Yep. We have your straight uh, rye, your straight uh, rye malt whiskey, and then we have yep. your smoke, um, yep. which is the single wood smoked straight rye whiskey. If you were to lead me through a tasting, how would you take me about if I came to the distillery? What should we start with? Pardon the interruption. If you like what you hear, if you love what you're hearing, please share the podcast. Please take a screenshot of the podcast, post it on your social media, tag us just to let everybody else know about Fermented Adventure, the podcast. We'd be grateful for your help to grow our podcast. Well, we'd, we'd obviously, we'd start with the gins. Um, we'd usually serve those in mixed drinks. In Finland, gin and tonic is, is the thing thing we drink rather than um, a martini or something similar. So we maybe start with the gins, tasting it on its own, because it's got a lot of character and, and a lot of thickness and a lot of like those herbal qualities, but then enjoying it in a drink and then leading up to tasting through the whiskeys, first the malt and then the wood smoke. What's fun for me is we've not done this before. Normally, what I like to do is leave the bottle sealed and yep. then try as we go for the first time. Now, what we did was we had a dinner party here at the house to celebrate Mardi Gras, but also we did this tasting event where we got to taste these Kiru, you know, distillery um, company 
products. So I had everybody give tasting notes, which was so much fun. And it gave everybody a chance to express and, and, and their own opinions, their own nose, their own flavor profiles. But for me, the other side, and why I mentioned that is because now I've had a bottle that's been open, maybe has had a chance to breathe a little bit. Mm. So I'm curious to see where my notes go from my first original try to, to the secondary try. And, you know, for, 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 for starting on the gin, um, you know, we, we had so many different opinions, which was so fun. Now, part of it is how is gin received in Finland? Because I know how it's received here in the States. It's certainly different in uh, the yeah. United Kingdom, in London, but how's gin, you know, received in Finland? Well, gin didn't have that much popularity. As I said before, we, in white spirits, we tend towards vodka, but uh, gin was starting to take off when we were starting. So we got the distillery going in, in 2014 and, and gin was, there was something happening there, but we kind of then came in and blew the doors wide open. So like we released the gin half a year later, we participated in one competition, the international wine and spirits competition in, in London, which alongside San Francisco spirits is the, is the biggest in the world. And uh, we won the world's best gin and tonic gin award. And uh, when we got that news, we we kind of like, we thought, you know, is, is this going to break the barrier in Finland? But we are a small nation and we love other people talking about us. And and suddenly like, yeah, London in London, they've selected a Finnish gin, who knew, um, to be the world's best in a gin and tonic. And, and suddenly we were everywhere. And uh, yeah, the reception has been nothing so so short of uh, exceptional things. Well, I go back to my original notes and everything's still there. Um, this is on its surface. It's a um, it's a 92.6 proof. Um, yep. So there's a punch here of, of the ethanol. And I think what that does is it elevates the juniper in the gin. I think it brings that up. And to your point, why did this win and become so acclaimed is because I think that that gin's really punching through. It doesn't get lost in a cocktail. And that was certainly one of the feedback items that we got that this gin, and I didn't know these things. So I'm just going to tell you, this, this gin would make a great cocktail. This would be a great yep. cocktail gin. Not to say it wouldn't stand on its own, but a lot of times you get these gins that just kind of get, um, you know, the, it becomes a tonic and gin, as you point out, versus a gin and tonic it becomes something else and you don't even know, except for maybe the pininess or the juniper in the gin and it all gets lost. So, yeah. you know, that that's where that came in. As far as the nose, and I, I'm curious to know, have you ever, you know, gotten this feedback before? But I get Fruit Loops. I get <laughs> Fruit Loops on your gin. And, and it, once once I took people to that, like, you know, you get the lemon and you got the the raspberry and you got the uh, the orange, you get all this citrus. It was Fruit Loops on the nose and Fruit Loops on the mouth. And uh, that kind of punched through, I think, across everything else. It was spicy. It was citrusy. It was lemony. And even today, I still feel like, you know, what what the residual in the mouth feel is this cool, minty but oiliness, the lemon or the citrus oiliness. So talk about the botanicals in the gin and what you're using. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this goes back to our discussion about, you know, how we grow up in different cultures and, and how that affects not necessarily the technical palate, but those, those uh, associations that we have with different tastes activating. And um, for us, the, besides juniper, which is obviously in gin always the leading one, what we have there is four really key components that come fresh off um, our region. So we we go out and pick them ourselves, or there's a farmer who, who sends berries to us. But there's a meadow sweet, which is this clustered small white flower on every meadow in Finland. And that produces the honeyed, uh, slightly sweeter herbal feel that you get on the nose and especially the front palate. Then when you go to middle the middle palate, what you get coming in is the birch leaves we have there. And the birch leaves lend it that there's a, there's a bit of mintiness, there's a bit of pininess, there's a bit of uh, even licorice root that, um, that comes through and, and carries all the way to the end. And in the end, we've got our two 
berries, which are really common to our area. One is cranberry and one is sea buckthorn. So this Arctic coastal berry, very acidic, except when you distill it, it's quite, kind of sweet and even a bit vanilla. So, so you have those in the end, then complementing the, the birch leaves coming through. So all in all, it's kind of like a, a taste journey across Finland, uh, summertime Finland on your palate. And the oiliness is exactly right, because what we do is we, with these fresh components, we distill them separately when they're fresh. We macerate and we distill in a way that leaves a lot of the essential oils that give the, the botanicals their taste. We leave them in and we don't dilute it with further alcohol just to improve our yield. What you get is this very thick liquid with a with a proper mouthfeel on it. And it works so well, let's say gin and tonic, the bubbles pick up the oils, you get a fantastic nose on it, but it really can hold its own, whether it's in a Negroni or a, uh, or a Gimlet even. So you, you get the real flavor of the gin. Somebody mentioned making a bee's knees out of this. And I think that yes. honey with those roots and berries that you're finding in Finland would be a wonderful complement to this gin. I'm enjoying it now for the second time, and I love it even more. And understanding more about what goes into this, it's uniquely Finland, it's uniquely craft. And this is exactly why, you know, you need to branch out a little bit and try mm. these products because what's going to happen is, you're going to find your new favorite gin, you know, and I haven't even gotten to the whiskeys, but the, yeah. the gin, you know, now that I tried it again for the second time, it, it, it even punched up more and I'm really enjoying it more this time around and having a clean palate to go to the, the, the gin itself, like I said, would stand up very well in a cocktail and, and, and hearing those uh, awards and accolades, I, I can certainly understand this. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and I, I think, you know, the, the rye here, as, as I said before, we, we make everything out of rye. So the alcohol here is rye. You don't taste the rye per se, but the rye gives us a fantastic canvas to paint the botanical palette on. And we tried the same recipe on a barley alcohol base, on a sweet potato alcohol base. It just turns out different. Even though you don't taste the rye, it gives it that feel of groundedness, which again, you know, makes it even like you can you can even sip this despite its ABV. But um, yeah, it, it's just great in cocktails. I think the rye gives it a little bit of a grassy tone or it gives it some sort of earthy tone. So even yeah. as you describe it that way, it's rooted. You know, it, that, that palate you talk about is rooted in what just the specialness of the rye that your farmer's growing and then you're distilling into this wonderful gin. Yeah, well, thank you. That's that's what we're going for. Everything you try from us, you have to find your way to the local soul of the product. And, and you know, that's our goal. Mika, where, where should we try next? The, uh, the Kiro malt or the uh, wood smoke? Let's go for the Kuro malt. So okay. we're not just content to distill rye whiskeys. We wanted to make them super intense on the rye. So... For us, the rye is not like the spicy, peppery <clears throat> that you might be used to drinking at, especially Philadelphia style rice. But for us, it's about those slightly sweeter, earthier um, tones that then twist into licorice root and, and a bit of menthol and, and uh, some other really good stuff that comes on on the lower register when we distill rye. and it's all malted. So it's basically, in all other terms, it's also a single malt, except it's not from barley. So in Europe, we can't call it a single malt. We, again, had this party. I had actually a distiller, Michael Dombrowski and his wife, Laura, and they own a distillery. Um, Scott's Mini Woodshop, who was a guest on the podcast. Um, Scott's very much into more specifically single malts. And so we, we, it was fun because we have a palette that I'll tell you what this, when I opened this, you know, there was a lot of intrigue and curiosity first, cause we started with this actually. Um, and then for, for Dawn and I, but you know, some of the things that we all shared together, which again is still re re resonating for me, you know, I still get the mint, I get oakiness, I get cedar grassiness. I get this sweet honey and earthiness on the nose People got brown sugar, caramel, 
Um, we we also had uh, some of the um, just different um, sweetness came out a lot. Um, spiciness came out a lot. Those baking spices came out a lot. Talk about the wood that you're, you know, are you using, um, you know, virgin oak, you know, first use oak? Are you using some other sources for your um, barrels? So we predominantly use um, ex bourbon, but we also have a component component of um, new American oak in there. It's about, I would say, 80 20. And then there's an ever so slight, like sub 3% portion of European oak, specifically ex sherry oak in each batch. But it's there, let's say, more as a binding agent rather than an explicit taste. So, so you get those like classic oaky characters uh, coming through, uh, but combined in the kind of the American oak uh, tra- traditional taste like vanilla and cinnamon. Because when we tried just fairly new or once used European oak, they tend to go really oaky. So you get a high influx of tannins and it doesn't necessarily work that well because we want to keep that sweeter side of rye all the way through and and tannins just tend to overrun it. So really you're distilling, setting up to rest in barrels and then you're blending everything together to get this wonderful, delicious flavor profile. Yeah, I would say from a style perspective, we are a, we are kind of a weird hodgepodge of of all the major distilling cultures out there. So we're doing single malt stuff, and we're doing it by distilling um, in copper pot stills, like double distilling in copper pot stills. So in in that sense, we're quite Scottish about it. Then our fermentation time is crazy long, like 140, 144 hours. That's a, that's a bit of Japan in there where we get a lot of the esters and, and the sort of the flowery tastes in already on the fermentation stage. And then in, in the US sense, we, we use unfiltered rye, but for us, it's just like, it's a hardcore approach. It's 100% rye. There's nothing else in here. There's not even that 5% component of, of uh, malted barley. It's just all rye. And, and you really get that in the end product. But if we, let's say, if we just power strip the, the grain uh, for, for sugars, like 30-hour fermentation, off you go, we, we get a really rough spirit. So, so we need a, a very gentle, long fermentation time that be, brings the best out of rye with, with our local yeast strains. So you're using a local proprietary yeast for what you're doing? It's not completely proprietary for us, but we've been do- doing a lot of experimenting locally, and, and we found the one that we really like. Um, Woody, uh, Michael Dombrowski said, is it a Quebec yeast that you're using? Uh, it, it, it is not. It is, it is okay. not. I, I think you, you get those same, some of those same elements by having a temperature-controlled longer fermentation. So let's say... 70 to 72 hours gets us our alcohol. And post that, it's a secondary lactic acid-driven fermentation where you get a lot of esters and aldehydes forming in, creating, creating those like more sweeter flowery tastes that, that could sometimes come from a yeast that does that, but we use like a more robust traditional version. How long did it take you to develop this specific flavor profile, given what you said about your fermentation time mm-hmm. and the yeasts and the barrels, how much R and D in the sauna was there uh, yeah. up until the point where you were bottling? <laughs> well, there was a there was a quite a few sauna sessions on the way. I have to say, but um, I think you know, let's say the starting period, Gura one point when. We had we just had one still, man. We we did everything in one still. We did the gin, we did the first distillation of whiskey, we did the second distillation of whiskey, and we didn't have a column to back that up. Uh, we did everything in a single pot still. So the the operationally it was just horrible. But as I said, we had no investors to start with, so that's what you do. Um, 
so for between 14 and 16, especially when the gin took off, we we almost had only room for experimentation for the whiskey. We couldn't really produce any volume at all. So when we got the lines separated back in 2016, I think September, um, that's when we really started going hard on the whiskey. But fortunately, we had that time to develop the, the perfect process in making it. So we could immediately start turning the crank a bit more and, and building up the stock. And in 2019, end of 19, when we build out the third stage of our whiskey distillery, now now we get to go at, at some you know pretty robust volumes. I mean, you know, European craft volumes, not US craft volumes. Those are, <laughs> it's usually a bit what, different. <laughs> there, there are craft volumes in, in the United States right now locally that, you know, maybe you're doing, you know, putting down a barrel a week and, and they're happy with that. And that's what they're getting. Yeah. But how, how many barrels are you laying down right now? I mean, is it a, a day, a week, a month? What, what do you uh, kind of scale that at? So we theoretically now have the capacity to go above 20 barrels a day. Um, so, so we're getting, we're getting up there. We're, we're not at max cap yet, but, uh, we're working our way up and, and I'd say we have about, ooh, what is it like 6,000 barrels now in storage. So those are 53s. Yeah. All right. I'm moving to Finland and, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't get you guys earlier. Cause I'd love to be an investor because 6,000 barrels. I mean, people should be knocking at your door asking the how how they can get a hold of this. Uh, and I, I'm curious, because you talked about the climate in Finland, you know, talk about how your barrel house is and how you structure that. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, well, so we, we've had to, we've had to pioneer quite a bit there. And when I say pioneer, it's like, sometimes it's just like banging your head on the wall. <laughs> um, because there's no culture of, of maturing any spirit in Finland. It's just, you know, you make the vodka, the vodka goes out at you, all, all as well. But uh, for us, we, we had to start from scratch about thinking what would be the ideal way of, first of all, storing whiskey in our region where we go from minus 30 Celsius to plus 30 Celsius um, from winter to summer. And it's kind of like a dry climate as well. Uh, and then we, we think about that where, where we'd really like to be. And then we think about how does that match up with Finnish regulation? And we, we found out that there, there basically was none. So we, we had to go and ask, so like, here's how we'd like to do it. What do you think? And, and we, what we got was like some, some, some like okay reactions and some reactions like, yeah, if, if things go above 22 degrees Celsius, the whiskey will explode. So you need to air condition your warehouses. And we we tried to get them to go to, you know, Kentucky and some of those like sheet metal brick houses to, to see like how how hot is it is in there and how, how it works. But but no, we we need to now AC our warehouses. Then for the winter, we need to pump our waste heat from the process through the warehouses so that it doesn't get too cold when it's like minus 30 out there. And um, yeah, we, we we had to build a lot of functionality into the warehousing, which makes it really expensive. So it's been quite a painful journey building up that stock, but we're now happy to have it. I'm curious, you know, you you what you I'm gonna geek out with you a little bit because my my curiosity is you really are now controlling the climate. You're controlling the mood, you're controlling the movement in and out of that wood. Yeah. And you know, from when you start opening up these barrels, are these, you know, the ones that are being offered now, we're talking at least aged a minimum of four years, two years. What's what's that aging point to where you are now? So in the EU, you have to mature whiskey for at least three years. And in these um, bottlings we're releasing now, we'd have casks between three and six. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that maturation period, really, we're, we're still searching for the sweet spot. I don't think we want to go too old with it for since for us the the nature of the core liquid the the new make distillate is so integral that the cask can't just take it over so we will see where we go but um it is really interesting since we control so much so what we do for instance we have a five segment warehouse our main warehouse and we have 200,000 liters in each and we get to control 
temperature, humidity, airflow, and we also have both racked and palletized warehousing. So we can really start learning fast about our liquid since you know we're still a young distillery. So we need to just accelerate our learning to see where we really want to be. With that control and what you're doing, have you started to find in these barrel warehouses, have you started to find where the sweet spots are, where you find these these wonderful barrels are just coming from? Yeah, I, I think we're we're starting to see some really credible results coming up because we managed to build up a bit of volume there as well. Obviously, our big beast of uh, third the third stage distillery, we, we just started running it start of 2020 mm-hmm. when obviously we got hit by a bit of a pandemic and and uh, cash flow was <laughs> kind of hard to come by so we couldn't go like full power but still we're we're seeing some of the differences like the key differences between racked and palletized some of the key differences between high humidity and low humidity and and really getting a grasp of of what's the perfect barrel bro program where we aspire to be in like five years time. But we are really happy with the quality we're getting out of the stockhouses already. Now you threw it out there. Where would you like to be five years in five years time? Oh, wow. Well, we, we'd we like to be up in both production and, and sales volumes where we'd, we'd be in a state where we can really stand alone and, and, uh, remain in this kind of like state where our new brand, our new style of making liquid, our new whiskey area, our new gin area as well, really just keeps on growing out there rather than being subsumed by uh, somebody bigger or or changing trends or whatever. And, And for us, there's a couple of key things there that, you know, the business is the business side. But what we really want is that the Kura family will grow. By, by the Kura family, I mean both our employees and and, uh, and our customers. And uh, we create something with real roots, with real permanence in the small village of Isokura. You know, 4,500 people, rural Finland, not much to go on. Uh, so, so this has been a real boost. And I think if everybody knows in uh, five in five years' time, when they come to Finland or for some reason take a bite out of Finnish rye bread at a beautiful dinner anywhere in the world, like then you immediately think, hold on, I've had this as a whiskey and it's beautiful. Sometimes I just should end the podcast right there. That was awesome. <laughs> but we have still one more to try, but I'm, I'm yeah. curious, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the process that you kind of been regulated to have with the aging of your whiskey have you noticed how much angel share or, you know, really how much you're losing after three to six years? Yeah, we we started out when we didn't like uh, our, let's say our cast program was far from perfect. And, and uh, the, the first storehouse also. So in the beginning, we had something like five to six. Now we're down to about two to three, which is kind of like almost Scottish numbers, which is which is nice. But we are willing to increase that a bit if if it means that we increase uh, the quality as well. But it's all obviously it's like especially during the winter time, right? It's it's all about energy costs as well, which is why we've developed the system where we run the waste heat through piping to heat up the buildings. Uh, so so that's still fairly new, and uh, yeah, we will we'll see we'll see where, where we. Uh, where we go with that, but uh, I think it's it's been a in a it's been a massive learning process, and obviously the time delay makes it hard. But we are here for the long term. When you look at some of those barrels or some of the expressions you're producing, is there a single barrel program that you're looking to start to release, or or a limited allocation that you have? Yeah, we've done some. We've done some uh, back at home, so we usually have what we call a Kura's Choice coming out um, every spring. Uh, there's the day of Finnish whiskey in May, and we release something that goes into the local monopoly. So, you know, Finland is still being a retail monopoly country. <clears throat> we we uh, release it through them, and it always goes down a, a treat. We've uh, we've spread our wings a bit in, in uh, Germany and the UK too. So we, we've got some 
great stuff coming out. So we did the whiskey show here in London um, last fall, and uh, we brought out a Mont Basillac cask, which is like the sweet but acidic French dessert wine. And it turned like weirdly enough, it turned out fantastic. So so we, we do some of this stuff and we might have something really interesting coming out um, already in drips and drabs uh, by the end of this year. So stay tuned. All right, I'm staying tuned. You're distributing in Finland, certainly. You talked about Germany and and you know England and within the European Union. Are you are are you reaching like you mentioned? You know some some Japanese profiles. What's the distribution like for Kiru? So we are we are in 25 countries technically available, but it, in in a lot of those we're like really small. Um, so, for instance, in Japan, you, you do find us in in uh, probably most of the best uh, whiskey shops out there, which is which is great, and and we are happy to you know to do like more measured growth effort there, and and people to get used used to the brand and all of that. But it's really like right now it's Germany and the UK where we work in a much more focused way. Uh, for instance, like one of our five. Founders, so he went to Berlin. Now I'm in London for still a bit, and uh, next year we are really looking to turn on the jets in the U.S. So hopefully we can we can do some uh, some fantastic things in the U.S. for 23. Uh, sorry, 24. So right now, limited markets in the U.S., but stay tuned, more to come. And I'm imagining you're not even self-distributing or there are no distribution channels if somebody wanted to order and have it shipped to the United States? Well, fortunately, in the U.S., we, we, use, uh, we use a platform behind our website, which allows you to order into a lot of states. Um, so, so you can pick up our bottle just through goodardistillery.com across 40 states, I think, right now. But we we don't have like a massive presence on the ground. We have a bit in in the New England region. We have uh, something going in Colorado. So in in Philadelphia, we're partnering up with, through a new partnership, which uh, should bring our our product available in, in that state too. But for next reason, uh, sorry, next year we are trying to go not like fully national, but definitely start to drive a bit more good presence across the board. So is it, are you um, aligning with the uh, state, um, the LCB, the Liquor Control Board in Pennsylvania, or is there a partnership you have with a distillery in Philadelphia? Yeah, it's it's like a distillery partnership where we, we're starting to run. Are you allowed to talk about the partnership? Uh, well, <laughs> could, this be, well, <laughs> could this be a scoop here? <laughs> well, well, n- not a whole, a whole lot yet. Um, it, it's a, it's not, it's not really centered around, let's say, a product collab, but it, it should be something that brings uh, good products, both the gins and the whiskeys, quite readily available in the state. So, so hopefully something happens in in um, in a month or two already. Good, there'll be that distribution for that limited allocation, so I know where to go now. <laughs> well, those, not, those sound not, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> not promising you the specials yet, but they're coming. I think, you know, for us, like, th- there's obviously a whole lot of admin, especially when you're looking to come to the U.S. out from outside the U.S. So, like, releasing smaller batches uh, in this current state where we don't have people specifically working on the U.S. right now is 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 a bit hard. But they, they will come. They will come. They as a fact. Good. Good, because, you know, from my experience and sharing this, you can't come fast enough. This is, right. I mean, we haven't even talked about the smoke yet. Oh, yeah. That, that mouth or the taste on that straight whiskey, you get such a sweet pronunciation on the front palate. Um, you get honey, but then, you know, as it goes to mid and finish, you get anise, that licorice to it, cinnamon. Um, I, I almost got a little um, ambarana. And I don't know if you're familiar with that wood finish, yeah. but I just picked up a um, a bottle that Koval in Chicago does that's Ambarana finish, and that's delicious. And then there's Northeast Barrel Company here in um, in the in the Philadelphia area, and he does a lot of work with Ambarana. So it's a flavor profile that I've become introduced to, and that's one of the things that that stood out 
We had some nuttiness, cashew, creamy. Um, the, the, one of the things that stood out was there was a nice, sweet cocoa chocolate finish on this. This this runs so many flavor profiles. This hits so many notes. There's so there's so there's so much beautiful flavor to this, and it's a credit to what Kiru and all the all the founders are doing. I'm going to start sitting in a sauna and start coming up with ideas because uh, if this is we we call it a Schwitz, right? If you're getting a Schwitz, yeah. look what happened from a Schwitz. I love it. Yeah, well, th thank you for the compliments. Yeah. I think those are very astute observations. So, because it, it it is that it is that combination of the right robustness with the single malt smoothness, right? So, so there there are both elements present, and I, I think it's it's both very sippable, but also makes for a very thick bodied Manhattan or an old fashioned. So, yeah, it it's just like it's turning out really good. I'm really happy about it. Well, tying into that old-fashioned idea this smoke the the kiro wood smoke yeah. i'm a big fan of smoked anything smoked meats smoked whiskeys yeah. you smoke it i'm there i'm in line and so when i saw this bottle I'm like you know get out of my way that's the one i want just just for my own proclivities now with with the smoke i'm so glad again it's been opened and now it's, you know, the bottle got opened, all that that just kind of sat there for a long time. Everything got to get, let some air hit it. And and the first experience that we all had was, it was a very smoky pronunciation. It really, it really on the scale of smoke, it was up there. Um, what I got was on the nose, it's like you're walking through, and I don't know, again, in the little village you're at, I would imagine a lot of people are doing a lot of wood burning, right? Uh, they're, they got fireplaces going, they got some wood heating going. So you get this wonderful essence of wood that just permeates the town. Now, if we're walking around the neighborhood and I smell a little a bit of that, that smokiness, the same thing, somebody yeah. running a wood burning snow, that's what I got on the nose. This wonderful, just somebody's burning a little fire. And it yeah. was just so, it was so wonderful just to, to say that and feel that, um, but we also picked up sweet tea on the nose. Uh, we also picked up things like grassiness and mintiness. And, uh, you know, people said peaty, but we know there's no peat in there. So, yep. <laughs> but, but but that's the wrong way of describing it. And uh, again, somebody got, uh, you know, leather on the finish. Now yep. that I've had a chance to let it open, that smokiness kind of, it, it doesn't come as pronounced from the first opening. And this is my experience and why I share you know, sometimes if you if you try something, let it breathe, let it sit, let it relax, and then come back to it. Same thing with a bottle. This yeah. came all the way from Finland. It needed some time just to settle out and let some air hit it. You know, we, we all need that from time to time. What are some of the um, profiles, nose, and flavor that, uh, you know, that to share with, uh, you know, what, you know, the distiller and you as the founders are, were looking for? And why would you pick a smoke? Yeah, I mean, we we in the Nordic we we drink a lot of smoky whiskey uh, to start with, and we were wondering, do we have anything that's again somehow connected to the local character? What's our take on on this whole thing, rather than just again going a very typical Scottish peated style um, whiskey making route? So in Finland, uh, when when we harvest our rye historically we've needed to be right out there planting again because we plant winter rye that needs to go into the ground before the ground freezes and in that small time period in between you have to make sure your rye keeps for the winter so you kind of quick dry it out by burning a bonfire of alder wood under it and that's still the process uh, there's a mill in, in eastern Finland that still uses this process which actually also produces a smoky rye bread which is which is really interesting um so in this process, it's not like a maltings process at all. It's a drying out process. And, and we get that older wood smoke in there. And the smoke profile here, rather than being the heavy, turfy uh, smoke that you, you get from, from burning peat, here we go a bit more like light, minerally. Um, and like you pointed out, when, once it sits for just a bit, it, it mellows out even more. 
and it's not like it's not like coming to an active bonfire. It's like coming to a fire on the beach side. But it's it's been the fire's been out already for 15 minutes. But you have that minerally metallic taste in the air that you know that there's been a fire here. It's no longer going, but you you get a wonderful afterthought, and and that's the kind of the vibe we're going for here. When I asked people, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we had just five, me included, we had five raving fans of Kuro and everything you're producing. What I would say is from the you know, from, from what everybody said in their excitement, if you see this in a bar, buy a pour. If you see this in a bar and you want to have somebody make a cocktail out of it, whether it's the gin or the whiskeys, tell them, hey, if you're doing, you know, an old fashioned or a Manhattan or whatever, this is what I'd like rather than the well you're using. If you see this bottle somewhere, pick it up. Because from what I hear, especially in the United States, we may not see a lot of this right now. This is a treasure, and this is something you're going to want to have on your bar. That smoky, we, I love smoky old fashions. I don't have to smoke the old fashioned yeah. with this smoked rye. It's already there. It's got everything in. I want to add maybe a little maple syrup to that, some bitters, maybe, uh, you know, um, an Amaro, um, or just something to give it a little bit of that, that bitterness to it. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm running. I'm having fun with that. All of these expressions are delicious. New fans can't wait to see in the United States and uh, fully. I know we give it. Hey, 40 states out there, you know, hit their servers. As you said, you can order on the website. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I don't want to shut you down, but, you know, like, you know, let, let's get a little impact. Maybe a couple bottles, you know, going out the door uh, it would to, be great. to the states. <laughs> Mika, I know I kept you a little longer than we talked about. This has been a treat for me. And this is why we do for Minute Adventure for Dawn and I, you know, for us starting out, I don't think we would have ever expected to get a chance to spend such a wonderful time with you and 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 taste and enjoy what these five founders created. Is there anything we haven't talked about on the podcast today that you want people to know or share? Well, the on, only thing is that we are, we always in mid-August, we do our distillery festival. We got gin and whiskey on tap. We've got fantastic music, kind of the who's who of Finnish indie. And we've got 2,000 people on the distillery yard. So if you've ever been thinking about a trip up north, now's the time to come to Finland. See you there. See you there. I, I think we need to put it on our, like, like you said, hey, maybe next year you'll be not 2023, but 2024, you'll be at Barcon in Brooklyn. Yeah. Maybe we'll put, you know, we'll get to Finland, you know, in the future. I would love to meet you in person. I want to do a, re, you know, a reenactment of this whole sauna thing. I don't mean the harbor on that, but it sounds like so much fun. And, uh, Thank you so much for being a friend of Fermented Adventure. I can't wait to see more of these expressions and 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 see more of these bottles hit the United States shelves. And uh, this is amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks a lot, Rich. Great to talk to you. Great to talk to your audience. Fantastic. Now, if I said cheers, what do I say in Finland? You say keep peace. Keep peace. I love keep it. Peace. <laughs> keep peace. Thanks. <laughs>